So I wanted to um, set the stage this morning by uh, talking to Coben, whose organization, the IAPP, um, is, represents privacy professionals all over the world. They have a great pulse on what's going on both here and abroad. And Coben, I wanted you to sort of help us get a landscape of sort of what, where we stand now. Um, there's been a host of governments, both here, more on the state and local side, not so much here in Washington yet. Um, and obviously in Europe and elsewhere, we've seen a lot of privacy rules come down the pipe. So if you are advising a, a business right now, what would you tell them about how to design a privacy program given all of the rules, all the changes in technology? Cool, thanks so much and thanks for being here. That's a great question. We are a global, like you said, an, uh, we are global, we're a nonprofit uh, professional association and so we're focused on um, defining, promoting and improving the profession of privacy around the world. Um, and that, the profession, has always been a principles-based one, something that we, is rooted in things like transparency and user empowerment, um, and those are the things that have guided it over the years, even before regulatory scrutiny became uh, more pointed. Uh, this year, we are st starting to refer to as the year of digital entropy, uh, because, oh. <laughs> because... That sounds foreboding. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, so much, uh, there's just so much complexifying in, uh, across the world in terms of regulations and, um, and the types of uh, requirements that we're seeing. Um, there's a few themes there that I'll quickly unpack to maybe set the stage, and I think this will help for the rest of our conversation. Um, one is just the, the spread of privacy rules, right? And so, and that's part of what businesses uh, have to grapple with is maybe a patchwork, maybe not, of uh, different rules and standards across the United States as state laws come online. Uh, we, had, we have twice as many state laws, uh, comprehensive state privacy laws today than we did this time last year. Mm. Um, and, uh, and also around the world, uh, we now uh, have 75% of the population of the world is covered by uh, uh, data protection or privacy laws. Um, uh, not the United States, of course, uh, as you mentioned. Yes. We don't yet have a, a comprehensive consumer privacy law, although we have a lot of sectoral laws and other things like that. And all of those contribute to the compliance and the, um, and the practices that companies and all types of organizations are embracing. Um, we also see uh, the, the spread of um, uh, just the, a change in how we're thinking about uh, the standard practices within private, or the standard definitions within privacy. So things like mm -hmm. personal data, sensitive personal data, new technologies are really challenging that, uh, those, uh, those definitions, and, and regulators are starting to notice that and kind of expand the scope of what they think of when you think of health information or biometric data and things like that. Um, and some of that's driven by things like AI, I'm glad to be the first person to speak today because now I get to be the first person to say the <laughs> to word AI. AI. <laughs> you yes. said AI. No, so there you go. Um, and then finally, I think the uh, the complexifying is also um, due to uh, this different realms intersecting with like regulatory realms intersecting with privacy, um, things like uh, antitrust, uh, safety, all sure. of these things kind of converging around personal data. So do you basically need an army of compliance people now if you're a business trying to design a privacy program for your users, for consumers, just to get your head around all these different rules? I think it's good to at least have one person, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> that's um, yeah, it's good to have that someone it's all on that's, you. that's like, has the expertise, has the credentials that actually um, show that they're aware, able to keep up with the best practices because it is always an evolving thing and that's a big role that the profession itself plays is kind of keeping that, uh, keeping everyone on the same page and, and sharing knowledge about what. Um, what the expectation should be around personal data as it evolves. Got it. And Jason, um, your group represents sort of the who's who of technology companies. You have obviously borne the brunt of you know some of the criticisms when it comes to privacy issues, but at the same time, they're sort of caught between being blamed, but also pleading for rules, especially here uh, to, as Coben said, to address some of these patchwork issues. 
Where do you see uh, the pressing points that your members are facing, um, especially with Europe sort of surging ahead? How, how does that affect how uh, policy programs are designed, especially again when a lot of your members are sort of setting the precedent and sort of setting the example for a lot of others? It is interesting, the perception that uh, privacy issues are, uh, are technology industry issues. Of course, uh, we're flattered uh, at that uh, <laughs> perception, um, but it's an all industry issue. Every industry segment, whether it's healthcare, financial services, uh, medical professions, uh, uh, education, everybody cares about privacy and everybody's impacted by rules regulating the use of data. So it certainly is important for the technology industry, but it's equally, if not more important for the industries that the technology industry serves. And you're right that the global perspective is important to, to take here because Europe, uh, about five years ago, uh, GDPR went into effect, really kind of the, the trend-setting global privacy regime. And now on the five-year anniversary, Europe is about to do some modifications to GDPR. On March 11th, the European Parliament will consider some, uh, some upgrades, they would say, uh, some downgrades, we might say, to the <laughs> privacy regime. But that global perspective is important because, of course, all industries, again, 95% the world's consumers live outside the U.S., so even U.S. companies need to take a global perspective uh, if they want to reach those markets. And for privacy rules, it's hard to design programs and products and services um, uh, that ring fence a particular border, whether it's a country border or a state border. The magic of GDPR was instead of 28 at the time, now 27 separate privacy regimes in Europe, you have one. Uh, and that was kind of trend setting. The magic of a federal privacy law here in the US is instead of 50 plus privacy regimes, we'd have one. And you see a lot of sector specific ideas coming up. Just yesterday, the Biden administration released the data security executive <coughs> order, um, which was uh, well intentioned. You know, we'll look forward to uh, participating in the Justice Department's rulemaking out of that. Uh, but even in that rulemaking, uh, even in the executive order, the Biden administration highlighted how important a federal privacy law still is to do to address the kind of questions that come up in that. So we're certainly keen to see a global approach. We were very heartened <coughs> when the US and the EU negotiated a transatlantic data flow uh, agreement um, that restored the flow of data between the US, the US and, and the EU. That's a $1 trillion market um, that was able to restart because of that. But I think the challenges uh, of not having a privacy law here in the US are paramount, particularly in the area of AI. And you're seeing a couple things happen. You're seeing a lot of states move forward, adopting their own privacy laws, adopting their own AI laws, which is going to be a challenge uh, for all industries, not just the tech industry. But you're also seeing at the same time a lot of industries work together. You saw Meta and IBM, for example, launch uh, together with dozens of partners the AI Alliance which is designed to show that industry is not going to wait, uh, mm -hmm. that it is going to move forward uh, and, and make the necessary uh, policies and procedures uh, to protect consumers. But a federal privacy law is the key to addressing all of these challenges. <laughs> yeah, I kind of feel like that's like waiting for Godot. I've been <laughs> following this issue for a long time, and I've yet to see uh, any sort of sign of that coming down the pipeline. Don't give up hope. <laughs> yes, exactly. Keep hope alive. Um, but on the... Uh, on the executive order and just the Biden administration in general, um, in the absence of a federal privacy law, they have been tough on enforcement, especially uh, with the FTC. So how does that affect your members in terms of sort of de facto finding out that something's a problem, at least you know, from sort of the agency standpoint, and having to maybe work backwards in terms of designing their privacy program. It, it's certainly not ideal, and that's why the tech industry, why ITI has been pushing for a federal, federal privacy law so we know what the rules of the road are and we don't find it out on a piecemeal basis through enforcement. That's obviously not ideal. Everyone wants to know uh, what the rules are and so that products and services can be designed to abide by those rules. So again, the absence of a federal privacy law means we have to rely on that enforcement regime uh, which is less than ideal. Digital trade is incredibly important. Um, it's important to US companies, it's important to global competitiveness, and if we have a federal privacy law, we can advance digital trade more effectively, more efficiently than relying on an enforcement regime, uh, which is less than ideal. Got it. And Lance, I wanted to turn to you because uh, your members uh, have special rules um, applied to them as, uh, as the banking industry. Um, and I should say, uh, 
this is a very auspicious occasion because Lance said he specifically wore a tie to, uh, to appear at our event. So thank you for that, Lance. Uh, but I want to ask, because of the regulations and banks often actually being held responsible for privacy violations that aren't coming from the banks themselves, but from third party vendors or you know, other um, sort of related parties. How does that then affect the banking industry in terms of how they design their privacy programs when they're dealing with such sensitive consumer information? Yeah, sure. I just wanted to stop and just, just reiterate what, uh, what the others have said here is that privacy is pretty complex. Um, in the United States, um, the banking industry is lucky, or the financial services industry in general is lucky to have a privacy regulation in place, privacy law back dating back to the um, uh, late 1999 when the, when the actual legislation was passed. So we've, we're used to this. We've incorporated this in our operations since then, right? And, and to be honest with you, you know, banks have things that people want most, money. Um, and prior to the digital world, we've had vaults, safe deposit boxes, and all sorts of ways. So it's just kind of built into the culture in general of financial services that you have this information. But back to your question, up and downstream, what do you do? You know, banks are used to uh, working with vendors. You have laws in place, and you're examined by federal, federal regulators of your interaction with these vendors, whether you're doing proper due diligence, and you have duties to monitor them as well. So, so that's the sort of built into the system. But what's become complicated, and again, and again, big and small, everyone is subject to the same rules, and you're checked. That's the difference between how some of these privacy laws even at the state level, they may um, put a set of requirements on an organization or business, but there's no one there to check. So I think that's, that's really the difference that we're working with. Mm. What's become complicated is our privacy laws are basically a floor. Um, and the state laws are layering on, like GDP, GDPR is simple. It's, although, although um, onerous in a lot of ways, it's for a whole, it's for, you know, a whole continent. Whereas we're layering on laws state by state by state. They use different terms, they have different requirements, and it just becomes really complicated. Um, so, I mean, we would like to keep our special privacy law, as you said, <laughs> and regulations, more for the perspective of that's what we're used to. I think harmonization is a term we use a lot, especially in data or cybersecurity, but we would love to see these things all kind of work together. If they're changed a little bit, we can deal with that. But, 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 but the complication, and, it, and, it, and again, the more complicated it is, it's complicated up and downstream, making sure your vendor can um, deal with this as well, and so, so I mean, that, that's kind of the regime we're working in. So again, I just want to say we've heard federal, federal privacy uh, law, I mean, we would love to see that. Yeah, so does that affect then the kinds of products and services that banks offer because you know if you're thinking about oh should i offer a credit card well maybe not because actually then if there's a breach or something then i have to deal with all of the you know the costs the reimbursements i, I don't think it's going to Im impact the products and services that you have you know it's just it's just going to impact the way you design your programs afterwards I mean, like we do, we're just we're just finishing up a large exercise uh, in the financial services industry with a with a, with a data issue. So I mean, so we we can account for that. It just it just complicates things really on the back end. Um, you know, already we can't share data like other organizations might. It's very limited ability to share data because of um, antitrust concerns. It, well, just like you know, we can't sell it. Uh, sure, we can sure. share it li limited with you know uh, related organizations and things like that, but it's not like you can just gather up a bunch of uh, credit card data and sell it off to somebody else. It's pretty it's pretty kept in that wall of the garden. Yeah, and so Coben, uh, just bringing it back to you um, for businesses and consumers, sort of grappling with this for on the user end. How do you see them sort of grappling with the complexity? Is it something that, because, you know, and we'll get to this in the next program where consumers aren't really reading, you know, the terms of service or things like that. It sort of doesn't, it sort of bypasses them or they, they it makes their lives more difficult, but they don't quite notice it. Or, you know, how do you see it from a user perspective? And then how does that affect how businesses 
businesses see how they should design these programs? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think that's it's important to kind of focus back on, on the kind of the purpose, the whole point of, of data protection and privacy, which is to, to um, is the user, is the people's actual individual privacy, whether con from a consumer lens in the United States or from a individual human rights kind of perspective from uh, in the European Union. But um, yeah, it, it is becoming, it is complicated for, for people to understand their privacy, especially with new technologies as we see like XR technologies coming online, new things that you don't really necessarily know what to expect from a computer that you wear on your face and the kinds of sensors that it might be having. Um, I think a lot of companies actually innovate uh, around the types of uh, educational uh, things that they provide to consumers um, and that's often not necessarily required by law, uh, but I think some of the ways that consumers are actually becoming better informed is not like from a privacy policy so much as from a privacy center or an um, upfront notice that helps to explain and remind people of the choices that they have around their privacy. Um, but that, that picture is always evolving and it's also made more complex by explicit requirements that sometimes can be confusing to consumers, like cookie notices that nobody quite knows what to do with, I think. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. It, you just it, accept, I just accept. Either you just accept or you reject. There's <laughs> yeah, two types of people, exactly. I think. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, and we're almost out of time, but Jason, I wanted to end with you um, in talking about, again, sort of designing these programs and whether technology is sort of hurt or helped those efforts. Um, have any of these uh, sort of enforcement mechanisms which has mainly been through fines. You know, obviously the eye-popping Facebook one for $5 billion, we've seen the Europeans throw out a bunch of numbers, but has it really meaningfully changed privacy programs and how the industry writ large thinks about this issue? Well, I think you've seen in all those enforcement proceedings uh, around the world, companies are trying to do the right thing, but I think the, the fact that these enforcement matters uh, exist tells you that there isn't the clarity and the, uh, the global approach that's necessary to prevent these issues from arising. Companies want to protect their customers. As we move into AI, it's going to be enormously, enormously important to give consumers and businesses the confidence that they need, that information that goes into developing AI models, information that comes out uh, when AI models are used, is protected. And so we need that global approach. We need that federal privacy law here in the US to take the uncertainty off the table so that all companies across the ecosystem, again, not just tech companies, it's all companies that are, that are caught up in these, uh, in these issues, uh, know what the rules are and know how to uh, abide by the rules. Uh, that's where we need to be and uh, we need to move away from a piecemeal enforcement regime to adopting the, the global approach uh, that will uh, address those issues. Great, well, I'm gonna keep hope and hopefully we will see something in, in DC soon. Uh, Lance and Jason and Coben, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.